I'd like, to Im I'd like you to imagine, if you will, in your mind's eye, shrinking down to the size of a human cell. I've, I've got a visual here to help you out with that in case that's difficult. <laughs> now imagine, if you will, uh, going thousands of times smaller to the size of a virus and going inside that human cell and finding the DNA and applying a patch to uh, a defective gene and thereby curing or, or uh, effectively treating a disease that's otherwise intractable. And that's what gene therapy researchers are currently working on today and have been for decades. N not, not the part about shrinking people down, but a part, the part about patching these and, and fixing these defective genes. So when I was uh, uh, thinking about this uh, talk, I, I, it harkened back to the days when I first learned about gene therapy. And uh, you know, as a bleary-eyed college student sitting in a molecular biology class just trying to absorb what my professor is, is putting out there. And I remember the discussion starting out uh, with the professor asking the question, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually get into the cells uh, down to the genetic level and, and fix these genes in, in, in people and uh, cure them uh, uh, potentially for the rest of their life? And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that would be really cool, but how in this world are we ever going to do something like that, get into these cells and fix genes uh, on, on the spot? And really, no, so, no sooner had I finished that thought than my professor uh, reminded everybody that, uh, in fact, viruses have been engineered over the millennia through, through evolution to get into these cells and to administer their own genes in, into those cells. And if we could only engineer out the virulent genes from these viruses and engineer, engineering good genes, that would be a, a way that perhaps we could achieve this. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, we, that's really cool. And in fact, we've already got all the tools to do that engineering and pulling the bad genes out and putting the good genes in. And, you know, we're, we're off. It's, uh, you know, gene therapy, that's, that's it. That's, that's how it's going to work. That's just so fantastic. And, uh, you know, I was taking a step back again when the professor said, but we have to remember that, you know, I guess these are viruses we're talking about, and they do, uh, even if you pull out those virulent genes, they trigger your immune system to attack, and, and uh, that, that potentially these uh, immune responses can be as detrimental to the individual as, as, as the uh, disease that you're trying to treat, if not more so. So I sat through the rest of that class and realized at the end of it that, you know, this is a, a very complex area and, and we've probably got a lot of work to do before it uh, comes through to fruition. And here we are, nearly 20 years later, 2012, uh, and whether you realize it or not, this is a landmark year in gene therapy. And the reason for that is the approval of a product called Glybera. Glybera uh, was recently approved in Europe for the treatment of a condition known as lipoprotein lipase deficiency. Try saying that 10 times real fast. <laughs> it's a condition that affects about a, a, one in a million to one in two million, so we're talking about maybe 200 to 300 people in Europe. And uh, well, lipoprotein lipase deficiency is, is uh, what that means is that these individuals can't break down the fats and triglycerides as, as, as most of us enjoy. And, uh, they start to build up in the blood and they can cause uh, conditions like pancreatitis and seizures and can even be fatal. So, uh, you know, we're, you might be wondering why, okay, this, this drug, uh, it's, it's great for these two to 300 people, but why is that a landmark in, in gene therapy? Uh, and uh, the reason for that is because this is actually the first gene therapy to be approved in the Western world, approved for marketing. Um, and this is after 22 years of clinical experience, dozens of clinical trials in, in, in gene therapy, thousands of patients treated in those clinical trials, and finally, after those 22 years, we're seeing that first product clear all those clinical hurdles and be approved for human use. And I think to the researchers in this field, it must feel like, you know, Sisyphus finally getting that rock to the top of the hill and, and seeing it go over for the first time. So I was recently asked by a friend what excited me about all this. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first off the top of my head answer was, well, you know, you're talking about being able to really get in at the source of the problem and fix it 
possibly for the rest of the life of the patient. I mean, that's just so cool to me. And, and that's, that's absolutely the case. But I started thinking about it further. And it's also that, you know, this is really the culmination of decades, uh, of generations of, of science and research uh, across continents that, that's coming together to develop better human therapies. Uh, you can, we can think back just to, to about 150 years ago, Gregor Mendel uh, first put forth his uh, postulate about uh, genes and their involvement in, in, heredi in, in inheritance. Uh, Charles Darwin, about 150 years ago, was putting forth his uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, and it was just about 60 years ago that Watson and Crick deduced the structure of the double helix in DNA. Uh, and things have really been going at a breakneck pace ever since then to develop better uh, human therapies. And, and that, to me, is just incredibly exciting. So we've come a whole, uh, a, a long, long way over the last 22 years. And uh, it's uh, wonderful to see this first product uh, finally approved. But we haven't uh, gotten this far without some cost. And unfortunately, that includes uh, 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 the cost of a human life. And anybody in gene therapy uh, knows this picture. Uh, this is a, they, they know the name Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, and this is a picture of Jesse just a few days before he was to receive treatment for a condition uh, known as ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Uh, ornithine transcarbamylase defici deficiency means that you're not able to break down ammonia in the blood and it can uh, come to toxic levels. Uh, well, Jesse was treated for that with a gene therapy and unfortunately uh, he passed away as a result of the treatment and the uh, it, it was a terrible tragedy, uh, and it caused the regulatory agencies to really look much more closely uh, at, at gene therapies and scrutinize them much more. It also caused the uh, proponents in industry to, to rethink their positions, uh, both in industry and academia, and uh, reevaluate uh, whether this was a course they wanted to go down, and many of them actually chose not to, and so there were a few years of, of, uh, of stillness in, in, in gene therapy. But thankfully, there were uh, some who persevered and, and kept at it. And it was just a few years ago that I was asked by uh, the folks in tech transfer at Wayne State University to evaluate some of the products coming through their pipeline. And one of those products was a, a gene therapy for vision restoration. Uh, it was developed by a gentleman named Dr. Zhou Hua Pan. And he's using a method known as optogenetics. Simply put, what optogenetics means is conferring light sensitivity to cells that are not previously light sensitive. Uh, Dr. Pan was proposing to do this in a retina where the photoreceptors have degenerated and, and, and thereby restore vision. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, that is just really amazing science. But this is gene therapy and, you know, we're still, there's, as far as I knew at that time, a lot of uncertainty surrounding gene therapy. But Nonetheless, I rolled up my sleeves and I started doing my homework on where things had gone over the several years that I'd sort of kept up with it in a popular press, but, but not uh, admittedly too much beyond that. Uh, and I came across some work in a, uh, by, by uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen, Dr. Bill Houseworth and Dr. Sam Jacobson, who were treating a condition known as Lieber congenital amaurosis. So all of these conditions, you'll notice have these really fun names, but uh, <laughs> Lieber congenital amaurosis uh, is an eye disease, and they were uh, treating this with a gene called RPE65, and they were really seeing some amazing results, uh, both in the terms of efficacy and safety. Uh, so these patients they were treating were, were really seeing some outstanding uh, improvements in their vision. So that was really exciting, uh, and it really uh, showed to me that uh, why the eye is just such a great uh, place to target in gene therapy. And you'll recall I mentioned that the, uh, uh, there is a potential for an immune response when you're administering these, these virus vectors. And uh, because your uh, eye is an immune privilege space, uh, and because it's a small target, you're administering much smaller uh, amounts of your virus vector. These really contribute to the uh, fact that there's a much uh, diminished uh, opportunity or chance for an immune response to these to these treatments. 
So I thought that that was a really uh, encouraging sign for, for this uh, treatment for vision restoration. And uh, I went further. Uh, I found actually a couple of papers in Science and Nature, two of the biggest scientific publications in the world that were outlining some of the advancements in gene therapy, uh, not just in Leber congenital amaurosis and uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency, but uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, which is, uh, if you're familiar with Lorenzo's oil, that was the condition that Lorenzo had, uh, hemophilia. So there were a number of successes in, in gene therapy in the clinic over the last several years that uh, really spelled out to me that, that gene therapy was coming to the fore. And so I did indeed recommend to Wayne State University that they should continue to pursue this course of research and, and, and intellectual property protection. And I'm actually proud to say that I've been involved in the development of that uh, endeavor since then. So we've, uh, you know, come full circle. We, I think back to the days of my uh, college days, the blue eyed student at my molecular biology class filled with the wonder and promise, but also all the questions about uh, how gene therapy was going to work out. And really, uh, it's had its, uh, I'll say, colorful history. Uh, and, and it's been brought to where it is today because of the scientists who believed in it and persevered and saw the promise that it held. Uh, and, and I think that this quote uh, from Helen Keller is really apropos. Uh, While they were saying among themselves, themselves it cannot be done, it was done. And so here we are in 2012, and we've seen our first gene therapy approved. Uh, you know, and I'd like to say that the floodgates will open and, and everything's going to be wonderful. And, I think it's a little premature to say that, but certainly this is a very substantial milestone. Uh, and, and so over the last 20 years, I mean, I think back to everything that's happened, and, and it's just incredible to me. Um, uh, it's, it's an incredible, exciting experience. And I am equally as excited to see what transpires over the next 20 years. And I hope you are too. Thank you. <laughs>